Okay, now here we go. Um, welcome to China Plus webinar series. So today is our first episode in 2023. It's been an honor for me to invite uh, Mr. Siddharth Kamani for the first episode of 2023 New Year. And he is a senior professional of credit risk at New Development Bank. So to briefly introduce him before we start, uh, Siddharth Kamani, Mr. Siddharth Kamani is an FRM certified risk professional. So he currently works at New Development Bank, a multilateral, multilateral institution founded by the governments of BRICS countries. And at New Development Bank, he respond, his responsibilities are risk-related. He's a risk professional, risk-related advisory for the senior management, credit appraisals for lending and treasury portfolios, and the creation of bank-wide risk frameworks. So prior to his current role, he also worked with Goldman Sachs in the market risk and treasury functions, where he gained hands-on experience working on various risk regulations. And his interests lie in the areas of infrastructure, financing, climate risk, and international finance. So today, he'll be delivering a keynote lecture with the topic of alternative data and credit assessment. Sounds a bit complicated, but when he gave me a briefing, I was so surprised to know how it was so much related to our daily lives. So I'm so excited. So I think now that's enough for me. And let's welcome Mr. Siddharth Kamani. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Daswara. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, so before we begin, uh, I just wanted to uh, thank Daswara Kim and uh, the entire Zips community for the invitation to uh, speak at uh, such an eminent forum. Um, you know, like Daswara said, the topic seems extremely complicated when you just look at the name, but it's honestly not. And I hope that uh, as we go ahead uh, through the presentation, it will become clear why it's actually quite an interesting topic. Um, I'll also try to demystify it quite a lot so it doesn't seem like a risk-specific topic. Uh, so I think one of the best ways to introduce this particular uh, topic is to uh, open your Alipay. So I'm going to do it here. I'm just going to open my Alipay. It's great if you could do it yourself. Um, go to all the applications and go to the section where you have personal finance and there's something called Chima Credit. And when you go to Chima Credit, you'll see that there is a score on the top right, and that's effectively your credit score. So this entire presentation is about what goes behind that and why is it useful. Okay. So now let's try to get into the presentation. So I'm going to quickly share my screen. Okay. I'm not sure if it's screen mode. Okay, so what do we mean by alternative data and what do we mean by credit assessment? So I think the first important element here is that alternative data is about technology and the changing nature of financial intermediation. And credit assessment is about credit risk scorecards. But what combines these two, what's happened in the last few years is that we've had machine learning and artificial intelligence, which has brought these two things together. But at the same time, when this huge benefit has happened, there are certain concerns around regulation uh, and concerns around ethics. So this is a one-page snapshot of what we are going to talk about. So let's break that and let's go one level deeper. So when we say alternative data, we know that mobile banking and big tech companies and fintech companies have changed the nature of banking. There is now access to more data and we have access to machine learning and AI. I think ChatGPT is a very good example of that. Um, and as a result of that, now because we have so much more data and we have the ability to analyze that data, we can do much better credit risk scorecards, right? So we can do credit rating to identify whether you are a credit worthy borrower when you go to a bank to ask for a loan. Uh, so banks typically would use a way to assess your credit score to say, can I give this person a loan? If yes, at how much or for how long? Uh, so that assessment is what we call credit assessment. And that has become, it's been transformed over the past few years just because of the access to data and the access of machine learning and artificial intelligence that we have. Now, because banks can do much better credit scoring, 
it has enhanced their ability to be able to give loans. And as a result of that, they are now being able to serve a part of the population that could not be served before. And we'll see some examples of that. So if you move on to the next slide, I think this is the interesting one, right? So let's look at the growth story. I think this is something that we've seen play out all over the world. We've seen it play out in China with, um, say, Alibaba and Tencent. We've seen it play out uh, in the US with Amazon, in India with Paytm, Google, Apple, everyone. It seems like a model that's just worked globally. Uh, so let's see what happens. So typically you first come up, these companies first came up with a technology platform, which was e-commerce. So you've got JD.com here, we've got uh, Taobao in China, you've got Amazon uh, in the US. And then typically they come up with a payments platform, which links to the technology platform. So you can now use WeChat Pay and Alipay to buy things on Taobao and JD. And then you also come up with uh, the ability to extend loans. So then you come up with financial arms. So and finance, we bank, Amazon lending, you know. So this is the, the protocol that's been followed across the world. And lastly, you come up with insurance and savings products. So actually, if we open the Alipay app right now, it's very easy to see this entire thing. So if you go to all apps, you can see uh, all these personal finance apps, which allow you to now take insurance, uh, to do savings, and to also do investment products right from the app itself. Right? So this is how the whole growth story worked. And the reason behind this is the e-commerce platform allows these companies to use the data to be able to then create a payments platform and then to use additional data from the payments platform to be able to now assess your score. And that's when they're able to reach stage three, where they're able to start extending credit and into other financial services products. But how does financial inclusion come into this picture? So let's take a look at that. So typically in history, there have these there have been these credit bureaus which do a credit score. Um, so anywhere in the world, when you would go to a bank, say five years ago or even maybe two years ago, uh, they would see two things. Do you have a credit file? Have you been paying? Have you been taking credit, for example, through a credit card, or have you ever taken a loan? So do you have sufficient history in your credit file, and do you have a good credit score? Have you always paid back on time? If you've not paid back on time, you have a low credit score. So typically people who have a good history and have a high credit score are credit worthy. So if you go to a bank, you will be easily able to get a mortgage loan uh, for 30 years at a good interest rate. But if you have a bad credit score, you are not credit worthy and you could not get a loan. And there are those people who do not have either. You do not have a credit file because you've never taken a loan before or a credit card and you do not have a credit score. And this is the part of the population which we call the unbanked population or credit invisibles. These people are literally invisible to the entire uh, banking system because they've never been able to do anything other than keep deposits. Um, so for example, people in rural areas, older people who have paid off their debt like 20 years ago. Um, we have students, people such as you and millennials who are seeking credit for the first time. So when a student goes, you can get a student loan, but typically student loans are very expensive and they would typically a bank would ask for a guarantee from your parent or from somebody else. Uh, this is the whole problem with the banking, I mean, with the way that credit lending has been going on. Uh, so credit invisibles have to usually pay higher interest rates. But now the question is, is there another way to evaluate the credit worthiness of someone who comes to a bank for the first time and asks for a loan? This is where alternative data and credit scoring is transforming the system. So let's look at a few examples. When we say alternative data, so why is it that Alipay has the ability to give you a credit score, even though you do not have a credit card or you have never taken a loan before? They still have a credit score from you. It's because of the phone that you are using, right? So let's look at some alternative data examples. If you are using your, uh, your phone to make payments, for your telecom, for your mobile phone payments, your rent payments, or your utility payments. They already have uh, some data about your history of payments. If you're always paying all of these bills on time, they know that you have some sort of credit score. Any personal financial transaction that you do, like bank account transactions, are recorded on your phone. Any non-financial behavior, like your digital footprint, what are you doing on your phone? Are you going on Taobao at 2 
2 a.m. in the morning uh, and browsing stuff that you want to buy. That gives them some, some history into or some insights into what is it that your credit worthiness is. Uh, social media, do you use social media? Uh, psychometric tests. There are ways now just to do through a phone, through a, through an SMS or a phone call. There's a way now for companies to assess uh, whether you will be able to pay back money or not. I think one important element to, to highlight here is that when we talk about credit risk, when we talk about credit scoring, there are two things that matter to a bank. Do you have the ability to pay back and do you have the willingness to pay back? A psychometric test would typically be able to test whether you have the willingness to pay back, even if you have the ability. Whereas typically the other ones would look into your ability to be able to pay back. Right? So let's go one level deeper and let's look at real examples. So let's look at the digital footprint. Right? You remember we mentioned about non-financial behavior data. So how does a digital footprint help credit scoring? Right? Some very easily accessible data is here. Remember, a bank is trying to assess whether you have the ability to repay and the willingness to repay. So if I use my phone and I buy, an, buy a flight ticket to go to Sanya, right, that itself gives a lot of data uh, to Alipay in the background. For example, they get to see what device you are using. Am I using a tablet or a mobile or am I using my laptop? They get to see the operating system that I'm using it on. Am I using an Apple phone, which has an iOS system, or is it an Android system? And this is important because alternative data and, and AI, when artificial intelligence and machine learning have been using big data to analyze vast sums of data in the past, they've already identified that typically people who own an iOS device uh, have the ability to prepay better than those who have an Android device. So owning an iOS device is one of the best predictors for, for indicating to a bank that, I have, that, I'm a, that I'm in the top quartile of the income distribution, which means I have more income in general. Also, the channel that you use to come to the website to buy your flight ticket matters a lot. For example, did you go to a search engine? Did you go to Baidu or to Google and then just buy, go to the airline website and buy a ticket? Or did you go to a price comparison website like say trip.com to then identify the best, cheapest available ticket to buy? This is useful because again, customers that come from a price comparison website are less likely to default than customers who go directly to the website using a search engine. So this is what the data tells us. You know, It seems kind of intuitive, uh, but sometimes it may not be intuitive. What's very, very useful for us now is that artificial intelligence and machine learning is able to, to analyze this big data and tell us things that we did not know before. Right? Also, the time of day of purchase, the email service provider, and one very interesting piece of information, customers who have both their first name and their last names in their email address are less likely to default than those people who do not have both or, or who have only one. So this is what the data tells us, right? I've got the source there. Please do take out time to go read this very excellent research paper. So as you see, alternative data is all of these things that you are doing when you are using your phone that you don't even know. Uh, you know, And all of this data goes in the background and they're able to use this to finally identify whether you have the ability or the willingness to prepay. So if I'm using an iOS device, if I'm going to trip.com and booking something, all these pieces of data go uh, in the background to Alipay, for example, right? This is the power of uh, big data. Now, an obvious question is, why is the system better? Why is an AI-based credit scoring better than a cre traditional credit scoring system? I think for one, this is driven by algorithms. It's not driven by one single person. Um, and so in a, in a to a large extent, you can say that human bias can be eliminated. It also uses thousands of data points or maybe tens of thousands of data points for one borrower, as opposed to the traditional credit scoring system, where you would only look at uh, the credit history, which usually comes from your financial statements. They would ask you to give them your IT tax returns, and they would look at the credit score of a bureau, right? So these are the typical three data points that would be taken in the past. You would give these documents to a loan officer who would then tell you to come after one week and then tell you whether you can get a loan or not. Whereas now algorithms can do all of this. They can process thousands of data points and they can take seconds to tell you whether you are credit worthy or not. 
and this is the amount of loan that can be sanctioned. Right? So this is how the whole model is changing. Okay. Now, one obvious question that would come to you is, it's great to know that we can use artificial intelligence, we can use AI-based scoring models, but is it actually better than the traditional model? Yes, you can do it faster, but what if the model does not work well? And what if it results in more losses for the bank? or if more people default, right? So there was a study that was done, and this was done by the Bank of International Settlements um, to compare the predictive power of a traditional credit scoring model and an AI-based credit scoring model. And what they found is that the AI-based credit scoring model is better able to predict losses and defaults, especially in a negative downturn scenario, when there's a negative shock to the system. Right, uh, And the performance of the two systems are almost comparable. The AI-based scoring model does not perform worse than a traditional scoring model. And perhaps this is because of the additional data points that are available to it. Right? So this takes care of the first question, which is, are they, are they equally useful? Right. So is it as good as a traditional scoring model? But a bigger element that comes, the moment I told you that all of this data is used by them, your digital footprint can be used by a private company, um, you know, uh, to look at the device type, the operating system, your email, all of this. I think one of the biggest concerns that comes out sometimes for us is, what about how they are using this data? So we talk about data privacy and we talk about regulation and ethical considerations. So typically, this is something that has been uh, happening all across the world. And there is a lot of focus from regulators on this. What the regulatory agencies in the US say, for example, is that they do encourage responsible use of such data, right? They recognize that alternative data has the potential to expand access of credit uh, in terms of financial inclusion to customers that they would not be able to serve before. But they hope that companies will be using this data in a responsible manner, right? And they the regulation is going in the direction which says that the use of such data should be consistent with already existing consumer protection laws. So forgetting the legal terminology here, regulation is actually behind the curve a little bit on this particular element, but it is catching up fast. I think data privacy laws are one way to go about it, but there's also uh, something about how the data is used by models. So let's get into the other part. Even if we have good regulation, is it possible for a model to completely eliminate all types of biases? Maybe not. We have heard about this term called inherent bias in models. And let's look at an example of that. You know, a few years ago, there was a credit card that was offered by Apple and Goldman Sachs co-partnered together. And they were offering credit lines, uh, but it quickly came under scrutiny for gender bias. The card gave women, in some instances, smaller credit limits than men. Uh, and this was actually something that was highlighted by the co-founder of Apple on Twitter. Um, and this is an example of a hidden bias, because this is not something that was actually built into the model or into the algorithm by either Apple or by Goldman Sachs. But it's something that was already there in the data that was operating behind the model. For example, is it natural to believe that there would be more data for people who live in urban areas than for people who live in rural areas. So maybe there's an inherent bias there. Maybe uh, it is possible that uh, the credit history of men may have more data points than those of women. I think the challenges that come with this is what if the data by itself to begin with has certain biases built into it? Can the model adjust for those biases or will it just perpetuate those biases and make it worse? Right? So this is an area of focus. This is something that requires us to ponder on and maybe for regulation to see if it can work on it. Now let's look at an example. Uh, let's take the China example, right? So just to show you the whole story of how it built out. Um, we know that there was a launch of e-commerce platforms, Taobao and JD. Eventually, that led to the creation of Alipay and WeChat Pay, and then the creation of finance arms, right? And then we have these consumer loans. So the whole story that we were talking about before, we've seen that play out, right? So from the top to the bottom. The most interesting part here that I understood is 
um, say you're a new merchant who wants to sell something on Taobao, right? What, what Ant Financial can do now is that they can use your alternative data and your Chima credit score to be able to give you an unsecured short-term loan for less than 12 months, approximately to the amount of 5,000 RMB. And typically these are paid back within one month, right? But what this helps a new merchant do is to create inventory and to be able to sell that on the platform with the help of credit. And then you make revenue and then that helps you sustain your business. This is a transformative thing that's happened because of alternative data, which would not happen before. Because if you're a new small business and you want to start selling something on, on, on an e-commerce platform without credit, it's extremely difficult to do that if you don't have inventory. So in a way, this is a very transformative change that has happened. Um, and I also have a few references here. So that finishes my presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions. I hope I was able to add some insights into this very new world of alternative data and how credit assessments are done to help the, uh, serve the unbanked population. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Sid, so much. It's actually, I, I was predicting to be a very difficult topic, but you kind of, you really explained well with the using the Taobao and Apple devices, iOS and Android, so easy to understand. And I believe it will create some, a few questions, but I also personally have a question that want to raise up. It's just a curiosity that uh, you were mentioning about the Juma credit, right? And how it is uh, the AI-based credit assessment is collecting the data. So in terms of Juma credit, would there be also a different assessment between the foreigners and domestic users? That's a very good question, that's all. Um, honestly, I would not know the answer to that without knowing uh, how the algorithm works. Uh, but it is a it is an interesting question. What I would say is, unless there is an application over and above what the algorithm has, Typically, the algorithm would just assess every single counterparty the same way, whether it's me as a foreigner or a local, by just looking at the underlying data. But the underlying data by itself may also have some biases between a foreigner or a domestic user, right? So for example, I may not be taking advantage of many of the platforms that are available in China for payments, whereas a local would be doing that. Right? Um, so I think this is the more important element. Is there already a data bias that is built into the data and not into the algorithm? And then comes the algorithm. So maybe uh, you would take into consideration, maybe a finance arm of Alibaba would say that for foreigners, we should have a credit limit uh, because there are certain regulatory considerations that we should take into account. So that is a different element. So it's, it's about distinguishing um, whether there is a bias in the data or whether there is a known application in the algorithm that you would like to apply uh, to be able to change the way you assess the credit for the two counterparts. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes. And I think it it help, it will help also with the following questions that is asked by the one of the participants that the in the presentation you were mentioning about the that you were comparing between the human-based credit assessment and the AI-based credit assessment, but uh, it also questions us that the in the end, the human is the one who's inputting the data the AI will gonna drawing out. So what are the the particular what's the drawbacks of AI-based credit assessments? We're only we were kind of mostly talking about the uh, good thing AI-based is better, but there may be some drawbacks. Yes, absolutely. I think this is the most important element that I want, that I hoped that the presentation brought out, uh, which is this particular slide on the ethical considerations, right? And the data privacy concerns. Uh, so yes, I think the point that uh, is brought out, uh, you know, is, is very interesting. Uh, the question completely gets to the point of, is it always better to have an AI credit system compared to a traditional model? I do not think that's the case today. But it's only because we are still in the process of regulatory evolution. And also in making the use of AI and machine learning more adaptive. For example, uh, there are hidden biases in the data. If I do not have a loan officer 
uh, looking at my file, there is actually a possibility that the algorithm is just going to look at the data and say, this is what the data says, this is your credit score, which is what is happening today. But it does not account for all the biases that exist in the data. An algorithm only processes the data, right? I think this is the biggest challenge. Um, so like I said, an urban user versus a rural user may find a difference in the credit limit that is provided to them. Right? And is that fair? We don't know. Right? But this is what the data today says, that there is more data available for, a, for an urban user than for a rural user. But does that mean that their credits, credit assessments should be different? Is a question to be answered. Right? And because algorithms work in such a non-transparent way, the only thing that you can see is the result. It's very difficult to decode every result and to identify why the credit score of one person is less than the credit score of another person. So in a way, the non-transparency is the biggest challenge. Then maybe the following up question can be, how are we dealing with the challenge, especially in a new development bank? How is a new development bank? Is, is there any tools or any other you know, improvements that they're trying to fix this uh, problem? Right. So interestingly, at the new development bank, we are not deploying this because we, as a development bank, focus more on long-term infrastructure loans, uh, which is more wholesale and not retail. So we do not have retail customers, but this applies much more to the retail customers today. Uh, who go for a mortgage loan or a student loan, or for farmers who go for loans to be able to create their crops for the season for which their revenue is going to come later, right? So it's more from a retail perspective. Uh, but yes, there is a lot of work that's happening on this front. Uh, if you look at the number of papers that have come out from the uh, Bank of International Settlements, they all talk about the need for regulation uh, and the need for uh, accounting for biases that are already there in the data. These are the two focus areas that are being worked on. Every regulator is looking into this uh, across the world. And because of the involvement of the BIS, which is a central body per se, um, there is also a lot of interconnectedness. So all the regulations across the world are hopefully going to converge to standard models, which is going to be the best, right? rather than each country have its own model on how regulation is applied. Uh, that's the direction in which this is going. Yes, I understand. So is there any movement that the, the world is trying to standardize or, or unify the, the model for the AI-based credit assessment? Yes, I think the, yeah. it's still in the research stage, I would say. Uh, the research stage is looking at how the interconnectedness between this works, how data can be eliminated by algorithms. Um, and a lot of research is right now going into quantifying also for example the one that i had presented here the predictors of the credit scoring model a lot more study is being done on this to ensure that the data is correct uh, just, just to give you an example one of the most important elements here is during a time of crisis so say we gave a lot of loans during the covid period right now or we gave loans during the COVID period. So say there's a big, big tech or a fintech company that gave a lot of loans before uh, a big economic shock like COVID happened in 2020. Now, during this negative shock period, did that portfolio of loans result in more defaults than the portfolio of loans given by a traditional bank, which follows a traditional credit scoring system? I think this is a very good comparison to be able to see whether a an AI-based credit scoring model is good enough or better. Okay. But this takes time. The losses or defaults from, a, from the COVID period are still playing out. It takes a period of time for companies. They don't just default overnight, right? They get into stress and eventually they get into default. So that period takes some time. And it is a general belief that it takes about two to three years. So we may be coming close to that cycle where we, where we may be able to do a comparative study to identify if these two portfolios performed comparably during such a negative shock to the system. Uh, this is something that is probably going to be a big focus area today. I see. Great. Um, I think another topic that can be raised out of this pre presentation is about the financial inclusion. Because as more and more we're uh, also relying on AI-based AI credit assessments, 
uh, you also uh, slightly mentioned about this financial inclusion that some of the developing countries, there may be uh, a lot of people who's not in the system, who's not online to be, to join this assessment who don't even get a chance about it. So are there any kind of alternatives or, or solutions on this? Right. So I think this is something that countries are working on. Um, so for example, it's about mobile penetration. So financial inclusion actually involves many more things. It's not just about giving a loan to somebody, right? The first thing that you need to have when we say that financial inclusion is improving in a country is for every single person in that country to have a bank account. Right. So the first element would be to get everyone to have a bank account. And the second element would be for everyone to have a mobile phone. And the third, to be able to have internet within it. I think these are three very important parameters for a fintech or a big tech company uh, to be able to use an AI-based credit scoring system. But for those who do not have that, they would still be a, be a credit invisible. Right? Uh, but from history, what we've seen over the past few years Actually, um, mobile penetration has increased in almost every country of the world. Um, countries have run popular programs, such as in India, where uh, you are able to open bank accounts for every single person, uh, free of cost. So even if you do not keep any money in that account, you can still have an account and you can still keep money there, uh, you know, without a minimum balance. Uh, so I think these kind of schemes are what are driving the growth story on this particular front. Uh, as long as you can have a bank account and you can have access to the internet on your mobile phone, you can suddenly become a part of this huge banking system, which earlier was not at all available to you. So the cost of becoming a part of the banking system has come down significantly. I think that's how we need to look at it as, right? All you need is a mobile and you all you need is a bank account. That's it. Yeah, I, I also can see that um, what the China's Alipay also did a great job is that uh, you can get a Juma credit, un correct me if I'm wrong, uh, unnecessarily having to have a bank account connected. Is that correct? I'm actually not very sure about that. I think mm. that may be correct because just from the usage of it per se, mm. Uh, mm. as a wallet, um, Alipay by itself is just a wallet. So even if you mm -hmm. have not linked it to a bank account, you could still use Alipay for payments, for yes. buying stuff in the Hama supermarket, for example. Yes. And you could generate enough data for it to be able to assess your credit worthiness. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it, the more data you give the system, the better your credit score becomes or the more data it has to analyze. So mm -hmm. if it is linked to a bank account and if you do have more transactions on it, more types of transactions on it, it's able to do a better scoring. Uh, I think that's how it would work. I see. Great. Um, I think so far we have covered uh, very diverse topics as well as some raised questions. And there are some open questions, you know, that we're still figuring out. But hopefully we can have a better understanding with the as time goes by and then with the better technologies and then regulations set up for reg like uh, unified regulations. Well, right. any, any last comments that you would like to deliver to our students? Right. I think um, just my last comments would be that this is a very exciting world. If you just look at this slide, it actually shows one very key element that this is a global phenomena. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is something that's happening, but I would leave everyone with one question. Right? We see that this growth story has played out, starting with the e-commerce platform and then to a payments platform and then to extending credit. But did this happen by chance? Or is it that companies planned to do this? I think this is something which would be very interesting to understand because I do not know the answer to this question. The best way to understand this would be to ask people who work in these companies. Um, but I have not done that, right? So my my curiosity lies in the, in the fact that did, did e-commerce come up as a means to an end to get to the credit scoring and the insurance products? Or was e-commerce the business? And then people realized that, you know, we are collecting so much data. Maybe let's open a payments platform and collect more data. And then you naturally went to extending credit and other financial products. So did this happen as a natural evolution or was this actually planned over a 10-year, 20-year period that this is the entire growth story? 
I think this would be a very good research element. Yeah, and then this can be the only sole topic for us to have a discussion for the next topic because this drives a lot of, because of based on the intention, whose intention was it? Human intention that it may also affect the AI-based assessment. So that's an interesting topic. Thank you for raising the question. And uh, hopefully we can invite you in person at campus so that we can have a further discussion about these. So. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. That's all. Thank you, Sid, so much for your time and uh, the, taking your time to deliver this lecture. And we really wish to have a second series upcoming. Um, so until then, we'll then close the webinar here. Thank you so much for the invitation and for everyone who came. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. See you again. Bye-bye.